you down, but how many are glad that inside of us, we're more than a conqueror? Amen. Amen. And what you got to do is we sing this song. I want you to just make it your profession of your faith. Just, just say it with your heart. Just think about what you're singing. inside of us, Lord God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. And I am not afraid. Let's say that line again. for some word this morning? How many are trusted in the Holy Spirit to reveal truth to you? Amen. If you're looking to Pastor Michael, you're going to miss it. But if you're looking to the Holy Spirit, the teacher that's inside of you, revelation will come to you. How many, how many have ever had one of those Holy Spirit impartations when you see the truth? You might have been studying the word, thinking about the word, but all of a sudden there's like a, your eyes get opened up and you go, yeah. Or sometimes it's your eyes get refreshed and you go, man, that's me. That's me. Glory to God. And how many believe the Holy Spirit's going to do that this morning? The Spirit of God's going to help you. He's going to help me. And you're going to get some truth. 
and it's going to take you to a higher level. God's purpose is never to just give you truth for the purpose of just getting a word out. He wants to help you. He wants to encourage you. The Bible says that it, our lives get transformed when our mind gets renewed. It is the word of God that changes our life. The truth of God's word sets us free. We receive with meekness the engrafted word of God, which is able to save your soul. This morning, as you welcome God's word and you're saying, Lord, speak to me, Lord God, he's going to do some transformation in your life, mind renewal. You're going to get set free. You're going to be elevated. Your spirit's going to be energized and you're going to get some faith inside of you and you're going to be able to move forward with purpose and with destiny in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 Everybody say, led to help. help. Now we know we're talking about helps and I got a lot of notes here, but as I was even preparing before Sunday, just sitting out there, God was giving me more scriptures. And one of the things that God put in my heart over a couple days ago is that God leads us to help. Amen? He leads us to do things. I mean, matter of fact, the very first thing that Jesus did, he was empowered by the Holy Spirit, and then he, the, the devil attacked him. How many know when the word's getting alive in you and you're starting your destiny, how many know the devil will try to attack you? And so right after that, immediately, Jesus started to call individuals, right, 12 amigos, right, disciples, right, to help him, right? But how many believe that as God was working on Jesus to reach out to those disciples, I believe that God was working on Peter, James, John, Matthew, and the rest of them for years. I believe that when they were fishing and they were uh, working as a tax collector and they're doing their daily functions, I believe that inside their heart there was a cry that there's more. There's something more. I, be, I just picture James, John, as they're catching fish, and they're just doing natural things, which are so wonderful and so necessary. But inside their heart, there was a cry. There's got to be something more. See, the reason is that because even though you're designed with a natural function, a purpose, God gives us different skills that we can do. Paul was a tent maker. But each and every one of us in this room are designed by God with a function and a purpose. And for, for you and I to be completely happy and completely content and feel that holistic sense of peace and contentment, you have to be following and pursuing your spiritual destiny, not just your natural destiny. This is what a lot of people where they miss it. They get so focused on the natural, the natural things of life, and they put the spiritual things secondary. They set it aside. And so God becomes an afterthought. My career is more important than serving God. You know, my schooling is more important. And none of those things are bad, but you got the cart before the horse. When you put God's kingdom per first, right. right? No matter what it is, there should be not a number one in your life other than Jesus. Amen. Some people say, well, I love my wife just as equal as Jesus. Then you're missing it. I love my dear wife. I treasure her. She's, a, she's, she's beautiful. She's a helpmate. But she's not even a close second yes. Yes. to my relationship with God. Yes. And you say, that's pretty rude. Jordana wouldn't like to hear that. I don't want to be a close second for her. We love each other. But what's made our life beautiful is that we put God, every decision that we make, we filter it with our inner conviction of putting God number one in our life. Amen. Our schedule. When we used to uh, work, and we work now, but you know, when we were at Bible school, <laughs> when we used to work, when we weren't in the ministry, but, but you know, we would, uh, you know, when I would get a job, I would tell them right out. This is what I need. I need Sunday morning free, and I go to church on Wednesday night. Non-negotiable. Some people say, oh, did you get a job? Yes. Did you prosper? Yes. yes. Amen. Favor, favor. I even worked at the post office, which is a militant, Mark worked there, right? A militant uh, thing. You know, it's like a military there. And when I got there, I was kind of, you start out as a part-time yada yada, and they, you know, they told me right off the bat, you have to work Sundays. And I told them, I said, nope, I can't work Sundays because, you know, I'm a pastor and I have a church. And you know what? Instead of me folding, they ended accommodating me. Amen. And I actually wouldn't use you. Did the other workers get mad? No. Matter of fact, the guy that was my uh, equal 
and we were supposed to switch Sundays. He was happy to work every Sunday because he's like, man, it's great. There's no bosses here, you know. <laughs> and I almost wish I could have danced. I'm like, I would have liked to have eight hours worth of work with no managers watching me. I mean, great. He's sitting there playing the whatever Yahtzee. But the point of the matter was, I put, and Jordana has always put, she was in the service industry for years and did all that. And she put the Lord first, honored the Lord. There's something about that. When you put God first in your life, everything else starts to work out. This is where a lot of people, they miss it. They go, how come things are not quite working out? Well, are you putting your physical body over? I got to go to the gym. I got to work out. I can't do that. No, no, no. God first. Everybody say God first. Look what it says here in Psalms 110, verse number three. And if you want to you see blessings in your life, you and I have to make that undeniable distinction. God's first. When the doors of the church are open, you need to be here. Well, I can't, Pastor Michael. Well, you need to be here. If this is your church, you want to hear what God's saying from this pulpit for you, because it's for you. How many know that the ministry that's coming from this pulpit is tailor-made for these sheep? Well, I'd just rather just sit home and listen to everybody. Well, you're getting a broad bathe thing. That's okay. But when you're coming here, you're getting laser ministry that God has anointed me to minister to you. Now, if you can't make it, and I, don't, I, I hate to use that word can't, thank God we have the video there, but our life, we should be putting the Lord first. That's it, yeah. uh, undeniably. You guys hearing that? Yeah. Now, no condemnation. How many of you are still going to heaven? You know, yada, yada, yada. You know, people go, well, you're preaching condemnation, man. <laughs> I don't like that, man. <laughs> I don't like that. You're actually telling me I have to. <laughs> yes, I am. Yeah. But, um... Amen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Notice what it says here. It says, thy people shall be what? Willing when? How many believe that today, this time, this season that we're living in is the day of God's power? But the first thing that he says, the people of God need to be willing in the day of God's power. The word willing means to be soft and pliable, easy to maneuver, easy to change, easy to bend. If you're an individual here that you're stiff necked, that's what God called the children of Israel. He said they were stiff necked that they were inflexible, God would speak to them, and they would go, nope, I'm just doing my own thing. And guess what? They ended up dying in the wilderness, never getting their destiny. If you and I want the blessing of the Lord in our life, we have to be willing in the day of power. And this is the time of the latter rain and the early rain. God's pouring out his spirit. God's got a purpose for every one of you. God wants to bring in that he's waiting for the precious fruit of the earth, souls to come in. But every single person in this room, not just Pastor Michael, we need to be flexible, pliable in God's hand and say, yes, sir, Lord. Isn't that how Jesus lived? Every day that Jesus lived, he didn't live for himself. He didn't live for his own purpose. He didn't have his own agenda. He didn't just say, I think I'm just going to do what I want to do today. No, he said, I must go to Samaria. He said, I'm here to do the will of him that sent me. I'm not here to do what I want to do. I'm here to do what he wants me to do. And when you and I start getting that attitude, guess what's going to start happening? There's an open line of communication, and it opens the doors for the supernatural to work in your life like never before. God will start speaking to you. God will start talking to you. God will start leading you. Doors are going to start opening up and your life is going to take on a whole new significance. You're going to be elevated from the drab, the mundane, the monotonous, living days of just kind of boring. But all of a sudden your life is going to be a spiritual adventure. Yes. Everybody say willing. willing. Everybody say not my will, God. Not my will, God. Everybody say but your will, God. Your will. Say not my will, God. Not and this means going where he wants you to go, doing what he wants you to do, saying what he wants you to say. Are you guys hearing me today? Are you guys hearing me today? Amen. Are you guys hearing me today? Amen. All right. Look what it says in Isaiah, the first chapter, verse number 19. Isaiah, the first chapter, verse number 19. Woo, get, huh, how many likes? What are we having, linguine today? What is it? That's linguine. Hey. Now don't start sniffing the garlic, all right? <laughs> And I hope she's blowing the fan that way, because if I start smelling it, I have to pray the prayer I just said to you guys. Lord, not my will, but your will. <laughs> Notice what Isaiah said to the children of Israel. He said, if you be what? 
and obedient. I'm willing. Guess what's going to happen when you start to be willing? And this is what we're doing today. You have a willing heart, and we're going to get to it in a moment. God's going to start putting something on your heart to do. That's where the obedience part comes in. It's not just going, yeah, I'm willing, but you got to follow through. But notice the, the rest of that verse. It says, if you be willing and obedient, what's going to happen? You shall eat. How many want to eat the good of the land? The word good means the fat, the best. Can you and I serve God and be abundantly blessed? Your marriage blessed, your car's blessed, your home's blessed. But it starts out with that simple thought, putting God first, being willing, and then going, yes, sir, and then doing it. And then God says, you'll eat the good of the land. How many in this room can testify to that? That they've seen the blessing of the Lord. Let me ask you a question. Can it get better? Can you get higher? Can you get further? Absolutely. Absolutely. The word says he will increase us more and more, us and our children. Everybody say willing. willing. Everybody say obedient. obedient. All right, let's go to 1 Corinthians um, verse number, uh, chapter 12 and verse number 28. We're just going to con- uh, consolidate this. But 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, talks about the body of Christ. And if you read the, the whole chapter there, it talks about how that, that, that not every part is the same. Everybody's different. And this is where sometimes we miss it because we start thinking, you know, I want to be a foot or I want to be the head or I want to be this. How many know the word says that God sets in the body of those, uh, actually, uh, go to verse 18, my dear friend. Let's just look at that real quick because God p- places us in the body and he says, and now God has set the members, every one of them in the body as it pleased him. Look at verse 19. Who's doing the setting here? And if they were all one member, where were the body? In other words, if everybody's just one foot, then there wouldn't be a body, right? Verse number 20. And now there are how many members? Many, many. many members. Everybody say, but one body. One body. Everybody shake your hands and say, I'm part of the body. Of the body. <laughs> right? Look at verse 21. He says, and the eye can't say to the hand, I have no need of thee. How many know we need each other? You can, the head can't say to the feet, I have no need of thee. Look at verse 22. They much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble. How many know they're necessary? And so this is where we get we get enamored and we get caught up and we go, you know what? It's just uh, you know we just I want to be you know everybody's got to be Jordana or everybody's going to be you know Jessica or you know uh, 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 Jerry on the computer. We all need each other. We need each other. We need each other. Now go back to that verse, the first verse, 28. I want you to see it. Because sometimes when we think of just nominal, normal things in the church, we think, really, sometimes it just looks like it's normal. I'm opening a door, or I'm in the parking lot, parking cars. It seems seems so non-spiritual. I'm in the nursery changing diapers, hearing kids, woo-hoo-hoo, and trying to communicate God's love to a little child that's spinning in a room, Right. Right? Or you're over there, right? You're, you're, you're working in a cafe and people are coming up. And it was a blessing this morning because I was actually uh, in the fellowship room and, and, and it was so nice to hear uh, uh, Desiree. <laughs> Desiree. It was nice to hear her communicating to the different individuals that were coming there. And it was really warm. It was friendly. It was beautiful. Hey, can I get you something? Really, I'm not trying to puff you up this but it was what I was sitting I go this is so nice you know and, it, what, and others have been there John's been there others have been there Bridget right it's such a warm thing people come through the door there's love in the house yeah. right and I can hear that hey do you want some water we got some ice and it's just wonderful beautiful precious experience that we're, we it's needed you're saying well that doesn't seem so spiritual no that's setting up what Brian does and what the Jessica's doing there and the parking lot individuals, right? You know, it's, all, it's all part of it, the worship team. And it's not like one's better than the other. We all need each other. Yes. Yes. Look at it says there, and God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondary prophets, thirdly teachers, after that, miracles, the gifts of healings. Now, all of us, we go, yeah, I want all that. That's great, you know? I want to be an apostle. I want to be a prophet. I want to be a teacher miracles, gifts of healing. Yes, and thank God, thank God. How many know those are still part of the church? But notice the very next one right after that. It says, 
helps governments, diversity of tongues. Thank God, those are all gifts. But notice that they're anointed and they're sent, set, and they're empowered by God. God put these gifts there. You are just as called as the apostle is. You are just as called as a prophet. It's all right here. Some people say, well, I just think it's nothing what I'm doing. Debbie and John, when they come on Mondays, when nobody's here in the church, and they come and they clean and they vacuum, I don't know about you, that is a ministry. Yes. Right? We can sit there, well, that doesn't seem so spiritual. That is spirit. And I know I'm, I'm naming names, but it's just the truth of man. No one knows that. How I many know God sees that? Right. That is, how is that helping? It's helping. Yeah. It's helping in huge ways. Yeah. Ministering to us as a body. Yeah. Are you guys hearing that? So when we start to think about what God's doing in our life, you, get, you need to expand your brain right in your heart and realize that helps is an anointed, powerful, impactful ministry set in the church by God. Yeah. Pastor Michael can't. And let me just say this next line. I want you to hear it very clearly. And does not want to do everything. <laughs> let me just say that again, Let's, just in case you didn't hear that. Pastor Michael can't and does not want to. Why? Because there's an empowerment. There's an empowerment. There's an empowerment. And it's all part. Everybody say all part. All part. Everybody say the process. the process. All right. Now notice this, look at Ephesians, the fourth chapter, and we're going to look at verse number eight, and then we're going to skip down to verse number 12. How many love the word? Amen. How many are open for God to speak to you this morning? Amen. Listen, you might be sitting there saying, I have no giftings, I'm a nobody, why would God want to use me? You are the exact person yes. that God wants to use. Yeah. God calls the foolish, God calls the weak, so that he can confound the wise and the strong. There's not one person in this room that God's going, do, do, don't do, 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 don't do, don't, 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 do, do, don't, 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 don't. God has a purpose and a plan and a destiny for each and every one of us. Amen? Amen. Notice this says, this uh, verse, um, verse 8, it says, God gave gifts unto men and he led captivity and gave, oh, excuse me, led captivity captive and gave gifts, everybody say gifts, gifts. unto men. Amen. And so he goes on in the next few verses, he describes the gifts. There's pastors, there's prophets, there's evangelists, there's, you know, it gives the fivefold ministry gifts, right? And uh, look at verse number uh, 12. So he gave gifts. And the reason why God gave the gifts, right, the teacher gift, the ministry gifts, the prophet, the evangelist, so forth, is for this. It's for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now look at that in the Amplified Version. I want you to see it. So God gave gifts, right? And so I am, by the grace of God, not because of me, I am a gift to you. Yeah. 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 And, and not only that, the Bible says, blessed are the feet of them that preach good news, right? <laughs> a word in season. Yes. And I am a gift to you. That doesn't make me better than you. And my primary function, my primary purpose is this, is that God gives the gifts, those gift, ministry gifts, for his intention was the perfecting and the full equipping of the saints, that's us, you, his consecrated people, that they should do the work of ministering toward building up Christ's body, the church. Amen. That's the purpose. When you and I get saved, the purpose is not to sit on the bench. The purpose is for you to get discipled, right? to be trained and to be equipped, to know your authority. That's why we're doing those classes, to know who you are, what you have, and what you can do in Christ. Yes. You need to discover your gift, develop your gift, and then deploy your gift, yes. right? And so that's the purpose. So when you come to church, a good church is gonna be doing this. It's part of the training. Sometimes people say, you know what? I wanna go to a church where the pastor is my buddy. And people get offended when I say to them, I, I'm not saying I don't have buddies in the church, <laughs> but I say to them, I go, that's not my call is to be your buddy because your buddy, you're looking at me as a buddy. I'm called to be your pastor 
Are you guys hearing this? Yeah. And, and to, to, to equip. And when you come to church, right, sometimes, and I'm sure sometimes when you come to church, you feel, wow, why, how in the world is, what, what, what is happening? I'm getting, I'm getting spoken to in such a deep way. Yeah. It's the word. And sometimes when you walk out, you're like, you don't have to tell anybody. You ever walk out of church and you're kind of doing this? You're kind of holding your butt. You're... Amen. <laughs> We're teaching a message on confession, you know, and that's a real good one. You know, the power of our words and, you know, speak to your mountain, you know, and no matter how many times you hear it, how many know you still need to hear it? Yes. And when I'm, 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 in, I'm, I'm here reading it and I go, oh boy, whoosh, and I teach it. And there's times I get from the pulpit, go, okay, adjustment here, adjustment here. How many know that's good? Yes. That's awesome. Yes. So the purpose is that God wants to fully equip you for the work of service. Notice what it goes on to say in verse number 16. How many love the word? Amen. We love the word. He goes, from whom the whole body, listen to this, and we know we're a part of the body, fitly joined together. In other words, set, set by God, compacted by that which every joint supplies. How many know God wants gifts, the body of Christ, to be in close proximity to each other. This is where the love walk comes in. This is where you grow and you develop when you're with people and around people. You're, 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 you're to jointly fit together and compacted. <laughs> These people that say, I don't need a church. They're missing it. I can just get by by watching it online. You are missing it. May I quote a famous song from one of those great bands in the 60s? I get by with a little help from my friends. Yes. I mean, no, you need and I need each other. Yes. And there's close proximity. God puts us there. So you start working in different areas and there's growing and there's growing. But notice what he goes on to say. Fitly joined together, compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part. Now, dear brother, could you put that in the Amplified? Let me just do that right from the go. How many love the word? Amen. We love the word. Yes. Woo. He says, because of him, the whole body, the church, in all its various parts, closely joined and firmly knit together by the joints and ligaments with which it's supplied. Notice this last part. When each part with power adapted to its need is working properly in all its functions, grows to full maturity, building itself up in the love. The body of Christ gets built up when each part is starting to function. And notice that. And when you're doing something, there's a supernatural power that's supplied, adapted for its need. There's an anointing that you and I get when we start to serve and as we're starting to do it and when we're starting to work properly, the body of Christ grows. Not only do you grow, but the body of Christ grows. But every, everybody say there's power adapted to the need. Say, so thank God for the power. Look at this. I want you to see it here. Let's go to Numbers, the 11th chapter. Numbers, the 11th chapter. And we'll look at verse number 16. And again, I'm just, actually verse number 10. We'll start with verse 10 real quick. I just want you to just see this real fast. How many love the word? And so Moses, how many ever heard of Moses? How many think Moses had a real powerful gifting, right? And it says, Moses heard the people weep through their families, every man in the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against, greatly against Moses also. Moses, so in other words, the people were complaining. And so Moses, God's not happy with it. And, and Moses is displeased. He's just, he's having a rough day here. He's just, you got to understand, these people were whiners, they were complainers, and we know what happened to them. So look at verse 11. And so Moses said unto the Lord, he says, wherefore hath thou afflicted thy servant? <laughs> he says, why did you afflict me? And he says, and where have I not found favor in thy sight that you laid the burden of all this people upon me? This is an individual that we're seeing in a moment here. He's feeling all alone. He's feeling overburdened. It's almost like he just, he needs help. And he starts crying out to the Lord. He says, Lord, what did, you, what did I do? That you, what did I do to deserve this? Look at verse number 12. He says, have I conceived all these people? <laughs> <Are> they, <laughs> have I begotten them that, thou should, that I should carry them? 
in my bosom as a nursing father bears the suckling child into the land. He's saying, he's like, Lord, did I, these are, I didn't, I, I didn't have anything to do with these people in the sense that I'm not their papa or their mother. Look at verse 13. He goes, when should I have flesh to give unto all these people? For they weep unto me saying, give us flesh. They're crying out, oh Lord, please give me flesh that I may eat. Look at verse 14. He says, I am not able to bear all these people alone because it's too heavy for me. Moses was anointed powerfully. Well, guess what he's saying here? I can't do it. Look at verse 15. He goes, and if you deal with me like this, if you deal thus with me, send me on a vacation. <laughs> no, it's even worse than that. He's like, kill me. Can you imagine being in the ministry and you get to that place where, and this is where his heart was. He says, I can't take it no more. Kill me. If this is how it's going to be for the rest of my life, Adios, I'm out of here. I don't want to do this. He goes, if I have found favor in your sight, let me not see my wretchedness. In other words, he's saying, man, I just can't take it anymore and I'm just very weak and it's not good. Look at verse 16. So notice what the Lord said. And the Lord said to Moses, gather me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be elders of the people and officers over them and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation that they may stand there with thee. So he says, he says, listen, he says, gather 70 men, get some elders, people that you, whom thou knowest to be elders. In other words, you've seen these people. You, he's, he's saying, Moses, you've taken too much on yourself. Look around you. There's people around you that could help you, right? right? So look at verse number uh, 17. And, and he says, and I will come down and talk with thee there. Notice what he says. He says, I will take of the spirit which is upon thee, and I will put it on them, that they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not alone. Is there something that happens to you and me when you become a partaker, when you're submitted into a ministry? You're like, well, Pastor Michael, I just think you're anointed. Do you realize that the anointing that's on my life, when you and I start to serve, a portion of what God's doing here gets spread out to the yes. people of God? Yes. Do you see that? Yeah. He, said, he said, I'm going to take from you, Moses, and I'm going to put it on a, why didn't God just mul give more, more, Moses more power, more strength? That's not what he needed. He needed others to help him. Yes. Are you guys hearing this? Yes. Others to help. And some of you, I'm not, I say this in general. Sometimes we just think, well, just let Pastor Michael, let Jordana do it. She's really good. <laughs> and she is. But if anybody, Jerry's known my wife and Brian and Danita, they've known him for a long time. Anybody that's known my wife for any season, Jackie's known her for a real long time. You're going to notice there are times Jordina is spinning. You say, well, Pastor Michael, why don't you do more then? Well, I know where my... Let's go to Acts the seventh chapter. Because <laughs> some of you are like, why don't you do more then? Why don't, what are you, how could you do that to your dear wife? Because I love her. No. <laughs> but, but you see it. And we thank God for like Brian, they're very sensitive. Jerry's very sensitive. People that have been around Jordana for a season, they know, you can see it. How can we help you? What do we got to do? Notice Acts, the sixth chapter, verse number one. How many love the word? Amen. How many love Pastor Michael? Amen. How many are excited? How many are willing? Yes. He goes, so the church is starting to grow. And he says, the number of the disciples was multiplied. And there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. So they were feeding the widows. And so the Grecian widows, they were being neglected, right? They weren't getting served. But notice this, the church is growing. The church is booming there. And all of a sudden, this is, you know, the enemy's, something's starting to come up here. They, they, they're, they're dropping the ball. Can we just use that term? They're dropping the ball. They're not getting everybody served. So they go to the disciples, verse number two, and they said, then the 12 called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, listen, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. So they were going to Peter and James and John, the 12, and they're like, we got a problem here. The widows are not being served. So what we should do is you need to start serving. You need to, uh, Peter, you need to get your apron on and you need to get out there and start serving these people. Now, I'm not opposed to doing that. Anybody that knows, we've, we all see me, I'll pick up a table. We're not elitists here. We, we all have a servant heart. Yeah, yeah. But Peter acknowledged 
that, hey, this is my primary function here. My primary function is, is to minister the word of God and minister to you people. He said, this isn't a reason. Even though it was a good thing, they needed to feed the widows. He said, this isn't a reason for me to leave the word. Because this is, this is what I'm called to do. Right. So look at verse number three. And so he says, wherefore, brother, look ye out among yourselves seven men, honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, who you may appoint over this business. So what was he doing? Same thing Moses did. He said, let's find some people here yep. that are faithful, yep. right? And full of the Holy Ghost and let them start serving. And out of that seven that were serving, one was Stephen and one was Philip. And both of them had calls on their life. Philip was an evangelist. I think Stephen was an evangelist as well. And they, powerful, they were serving tables during the day and they were out there ministering. Miracles were taking place. Philip went to Samaria, had an awesome revival there. What are you saying? Even though they had a bigger ministry than just serving tables, they, this, is, this is a place they started. But it was needed. Our natural things needed. I mean, this is serving tables to widows. You're like, well, that's, yeah, that's better, whatever, I don't know. Please, it's something. But the point is, natural things are needed. And they're spiritual. Are you guys hearing this? You never need to look at yourself and say, well, uh, if, I'm up, if I'm back there checking people in at the nursery, I'm doing nothing. You're doing something. Yes. Yeah. And as each part does their part, God wants no loafers in the kingdom. Yeah. You're like, well, I'm just a baby. I can't serve. Let me give you a big hint. Big, big hint. Peter, James, John, they're all babies. And Jesus called them discipled them and it wasn't too long into their discipleship he sent them out to start doing some things are you guys hearing this everybody say yes lord Lord. look at job the 32nd chapter verse 8 now we're going to just so as i said all this i'm saying is god's got a purpose for you you're worthy (laughs) desiree go get yourself a coffee She's so busy serving everybody else coffee. Our dear sister, oh, she's got a coffee. <laughs> it must be exceptionally boring today. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. We're blessed. What was I saying before that? Does anyone remember? Job. <laughs> Job. <laughs> John's like, yeah, I've had three cups of coffee. I'm with you, man. <laughs> He wants fresh man. I are getting it. Thank you by the grace of God. But you may be sitting here. Some of you might be sitting here saying, I'm not worthy, Pastor Michael. I'm not worthy to serve. How many know that by the grace of God, you are worthy? Yes. That you are clean? Yes. That you are holy? That you are the righteousness of God? Yes. Right? So don't let the devil get on you and go, well, uh, if Pastor Michael only knew what I did. Apparently Jesus knew what Paul did and still used him. Apparently, Jesus knew what uh, uh, Matthew did, but still used him. Jesus knew what I did, and still choose to use me. So I want you to start freeing your spirit a little bit right now. Just Because, see, this is the part of the message. And, Tim, can you put that first slide up again? I'm sorry, dear friend. We'll go back to Job. Uh, for very, led to lead, led to help. This, I want you, right now, this is the part of the message here, because I feel like God's got our hearts to a spot, so... We're kind of like all opened up. or I feel like the Lord's kind of, yeah, yeah God wants to use me. God, God's got something for me. This is a part of my growth. God wants to use me. Pastor Michael, Jordana wants it. This is a spiritual thing. And, and, it's, and, and, and it's, it's, it's so important for you as an individual. Your destiny, starting out in this very little, tiny little things that you might think is insignificant. Ty's over there doing the camera. He said, well, what's, how spiritual is this? Well, ask those people like this gentleman right here, Pat, that watches us faithfully in Virginia. Yeah. Yeah. How, how many know that he goes, oh, Pastor Michael, no, no. if it wasn't for Ty, it wasn't for uh, uh, Tim, Jerry, and the Switchers, and other, Josiah, we couldn't be doing this. Right. You're saying, well, we're only ministering to a few people. How many know Jesus is not concerned about the crowd, he's no. concerned about the one? Yes. And, and it's faithful. When, and it's, he's doing this faithfully. These kids have been these young men have been, I knew them since they were kids. They've been faithful. Yes. I remember back there and seeing that 
You, you, you too, Sandy. Remember, there was a whole crowd of you. We said, it was almost a, a, a rite of patches. People would be in the kids' room, the young people, right, Josiah? They would leave the kid room, and then be, they were back there serving. Right. Cassie, we just, you know, we talked about, she's over there in college. How many, we missed Cassie. Yes. She was doing an awesome thing, helping here, helping there. Did, did it help Pastor Michael? Yes. Yeah. Did it help you? Yes. Did it help Cassie? Yes. yes. Look at Job, the 32nd chapter. I won't keep you much longer, but just stay with me just a little bit now. So let's just, let's just while the atmosphere is getting cleared, I want you just to just, just be open now. Just be open. He says, but there's a spirit in man. Everybody say a spirit, spirit in man. And the inspiration of the Almighty, what does it do? Gives them understanding. Gives them understanding. There's a spirit in man. That it's, it's, it's a word for breath. And he says his spirit gives understanding understanding. Look at that slide number uh, 13. I want you to see it, friend. Everybody say, look inside. Look inside. Say, God's going to speak to me on my insides. Inside. It means the word, it says the spirit of God, there's a spirit of man, it gives us discernment, gives us insight, gives us the ability to understand, gives us perception, the ability to see or hear, to become aware of something. How many of them, God's going to speak to you today. You're going to get an inner witness. You're going to become aware of something on the inside. Look at what it says in Proverbs 20, verse number 27. How many love the word? Everybody say, inside. You're going to get drawn today to do something that you're, that, that you're like, well, Ann might be going, I don't know, I just feel, I just seems, I, yeah. And that's how it might be. I think many times when we think about the direction of the Lord, we always think it's thunder from heaven. <laughs> hey, I am Jehovah God. We all want to be like Elijah. We want to, we want to hear God in the thunder. We want to hear God in the storm, right? But, but it's the, 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 right, the, the wind. And the, but how did God speak to him? The small, thin, tiny. And that's why right now we're creating that atmosphere. We're just getting our ears open. And we're like, Lord, Lord, speak to me, Lord. You're going to get drawn to something. He said, the spirit of man is what? The candle of the Lord, searching all the inner parts of the being. Notice it says, it says your spirit and my spirit is the candle of God. What does a candle do? It's the part of, a candle gives light. A candle gives illumination. A candle enables us so that we can see something. So what he's saying is your spirit and my spirit is, is the candle that's where the illumination is going to come from. Look at the word for candle here, slide 14. How many love the word? Amen. Everybody say, I love the word. I love the word. We love the word. Love the word. Everybody say, God's word, is good. God's word is good. All right. Notice that definition. I know it's a little long, but I, I want you to see it. And, and it says this. It says, it says the, the word candle means to glisten. What does glistening mean? You ever see something that's, it, it'll explain itself. After the flood season, the, the land is plowed, right? The surface of the soil, the top part's dry, right? But when the soil is turned up, this is what we're doing right now. We're turning up the soil. What happens? Because of the rain that was in the previous season, the soil starts to glisten in the sun. In other words, you can see it from the water remaining in the soil. The water is necessary for the seed to begin germination. So what is it saying? Your spirit and my spirit is the candle of the Lord. And as we're looking inside this morning, right, as we're stirring up like we're doing right now, I'm kind of plowing the ground. What's starting to happen? Things are starting to get turned up inside of you, and you're going to see something glisten inside of you. What does that mean? It's just, it's just like if you're seeing all dry dirt, and all of a sudden you see some area where it's moist, and it's like it's drawing your attention. Your spirit is going to, something's going to get highlighted to your spirit. And it might be a tiny, little, insignificant thing you might think, but it's important for you and I because it's a step in a direction of God. This is how God directs us. In closing, I want you to see it. Luke, the first chapter, verse number one. And everybody say together with me, Lin Guini. <laughs> now say it with a little. <laughs> say, say it now with a little linguini. Now we're gonna, I'm gonna teach you a little bit of Italian and say Lamore. Yeah, that means love, right? It's that. So let's say it one more time. Say linguini. Oh, see, I can feel the spirit on that. Say Lamore. 
Oh, I'm feeling it now. Linguini. You know it's glistening in my heart right now, right? Yeah. Now, how many think that, you know, when God, the Bible says all skip scripture is, is for profit. In other words, it's by the inspiration of God. And so when God put the canon, well, the canonization, they put all the, the books together, you know, because things were in sync. But when somebody, like when Isaiah spoke or Ezekiel spoke, it was by the inspiration of God. And it's very interesting to note, there are some people, or sometimes in the Bible, it was very profound, very powerful when these guys were writing down their thoughts, you know? You go to some of those Old Testament prophets, it's like, it was just very powerful. Or Moses, for that example, wrote the first five books of the Bible. And so he had such inspiration. Matter of fact, the word says that Moses was different than any other prophet because God said, I talked to him face to face. So it was very powerful. And Moses wasn't just writing about things, which is so cool with Moses, very interesting with Moses because he, he was a prophet of the present. He was a prophet of the past because God had allowed him to see the creation of the world. You know, so he was looking, he was here and he, God was opening his eyes and he was seeing things back there. You know, then he's, he's prophetically speaking to the people right here, but also he's speaking prophetically for the future. He was a very interesting prophet. Not, not quite all of them were, were quite like Moses, but it was very powerful, dramatic. So Luke, Luke was a a, a, a physician, and he, he, was, a, he was with Paul. He, hung, he, was, he was part of Paul's team. So he was a, basically a doctor, you know. But I mean, we've got, we got a spiritual doctor right here too. And so, so listen to this. I want you to hear this now because we're reading something from the scriptures that is inspired by God, directed by the Lord, for us to read. As a matter of fact, the word of God says that, that Jesus did so many things and said so many things that the world itself would not be able to contain the books. So what we got from heaven that we're reading now was very strategically given to us by God. It was handpicked because there was a lot of other people that were writing stuff, but they're not here for us. God in his wisdom has preserved this for us, right? And so here's this guy, Luke. He says, for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. So, so he starts out the letter here saying, there's a lot of, he said, many have taken the hand to write about the gospel, the, the life of Jesus. He didn't just say, well, since Matthew did, Mark did, and John did, how many know there was many more yeah, yeah. besides those three? Yeah, yeah. He says, for as much as those three people have wrote, no, he said, for as, as many have taken in hand to set forth an order, to write in order, a declaration of those things which most surely we believe among us. Look at verse number three, two, I should say. He says, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the Lord. So he even, he goes on to say, there's a lot of people that wrote. And he goes, and there was a lot of people that were eyewitnesses. Luke was not an eyewitness. He was not one of the 12 disciples. And and, and ministers of the word. And he says, and these guys were ministers of the word. Are you guys getting this this morning? Yep. So he's basically saying, hey, I'm just a doctor. You know? All these other people seem to be way more qualified than I am. And he goes, and they delivered that which was from the beginning. They were eyewitnesses. They were ministers. And look at verse number three. What's the next words? He goes, it just, it just seemed good for me also. Having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write unto you most, in order, most excellent Theophilus. He could have talked himself out of doing it. He could have just said, why should I do it? I wasn't an eyewitness. I'm not even a minister like they were. A lot of people are doing it. He could have talked himself out of doing it. But what did he do? He said, it seems good. It just seems right. He was checking his seamer on the inside because it just seems good. This is how I live. This is how I taught my kids to live. When you're making a decision, what's, what's your seamer saying? But it, it looks like a great opportunity. It looks really great. It, we, we're, what's going on here? Does it seem good or what does it not seem good? 
There's many times that there have been opportunities that presented itself to us, and I'm like, you know what? Uh, you ever feel like you're talking yourself into doing something? Like, ah, uh, yeah. Uh. It's almost like going to bed with wet socks on. It's, it's just something's not right. Have you ever had that feeling where just something's just not right? It doesn't seem right. But how many are thankful by the grace of God? The opposite is true. It seems good. Now, some of you are sitting here right now, and you're deceiving yourself. Because you're talking yourself and saying, it seems good for me to run to that door. <laughs> it seems good for me to go there real quick, get my pasta, put my hand on, and just walk away. I am going to tell you, as your pastor, as a minister of God, that is not a good seamer. As we just open our hearts... As you start to go, what's going to happen? Something's going to get highlighted. You might see the kids area. And you might say to yourself, I never had a desire working with the kids. Or maybe it's the computer area, or it's the sound area, it's the camera work, or uh, children's area, or it's a cafe. Desiree needs some help too. She needs somebody giving her coffee, right? Hey. <laughs> right? Uh, parking lot people. How many think it's helpful, right? We need some parking lot people. So what you got to do right now Right now, right now, right now, right now. Yeah. And something gets highlighted to you. You're going to get a drawing. Now, some of you are thinking, I'm going to get drawn to the linguine with the Alfredo sauce. But how many believe God's going to draw you? And you might not feel qualified. I was talking to my son this morning, and we were talking in the car. It's kind of like our thing, you know, we drive, we talk, and I let him drive me, you know. Because when I'm before church and after church, I don't want to drive. I just keep my head clear. It's just my heart. You know. Say, well, can't you drive and keep your head clear? Yeah, I can, but let him drive the car. <laughs> and I have a Tesla, so when it's, he's not here, I just put on autopilot and I let it drive me home. So it sort of gets me there. <laughs> it does work. I'll get in the car, put the autopilot on. I still got to watch. You I remember when I was, I was telling him, when I was 17 years old, my father was going to Italy. He, we had a little Bible study. He comes to me and says, Michael, I says, why don't you help, or Miguel, he always calls me, Miguel, why don't you help out while I'm gone? It was just maybe 20 people or whatever. And I remember telling him, I said, Dad, it's not me. I don't want to do that. I didn't want to be a preacher. I mean, on my, on my list, you know, it was, uh, you know, I, I don't want to name any professions, but preacher was really low. There was no, <laughs> no desire. So he said, okay. So then I went up a couple days later. I was praying. And as I was praying, the Lord told me, he said, help your father. So I came downstairs. I said, Dad, I'll do it. I'll do it. <laughs> And so he, there was an elder in the church, a, an old person who knew more about God than I did. I was just like 17 years old. I knew nothing. I still hardly know anything. And I'm like, so I'd go to his house like on the night before service. We had service on Wednesday night. I'd go there on Tuesday. He, we'd read a chapter of Galatians. <laughs> he would try to explain it to me, and then I'd get up there and just kind of say what he said, you know. My father came back from Italy, and he's like, I go, Dad, you're back now. You do your thing. And he's like, no, 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 no. And if you knew my father, this is how he went, no. He goes, you got the gift. Got the gift. <laughs> but maybe he saw something in me that I didn't see. He goes, no, no, you got to keep going. You got to keep going. I'm like, you. Of course, I was living at home, working with him. I had no choice. Like, okay, what am I going to do? I got to. <laughs> and so that's how I started. I, he, would, I, 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 he would say a little few words, and I'd start exhorting, and I started developing. Then he went to Italy again. And at that point, I was like, God, I just, to be honest with you, I'm like, Lord, I really don't want to do this if this is what my parents want me to do. I don't want to, I want to be, I want to know if, if I'm supposed to be a, a preacher, this is what you want me to do. You have to show me. After church, I was, I got on my knees and I prayed and I asked, I prayed that prayer. And I opened my Bible and God led me to uh, Jeremiah. Every, every preacher gets called from Jeremiah. Hey, before you were formed in the womb, I ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. And I go, but it, it felt different that time. I go, I think you're talking to me. And then God, that very night, I went to a church I'd never went to before. It was a small African-American church. And 20 people in the room. 
You guys heard the story. All of a sudden, people are giving testimony. He had, the, the, and the guy gave a prophecy. He spoke in other tongues, and then he interpreted it. And then part of the message was, you got to break out. You got to expand. You got to break barriers. You got to get out of your comfort zone. And I remember sitting there, oh, that's good. I like that. So he had everybody give testimony. And the guy that I was with, he got up, and he's, they're all powerful testimonies. I don't know if you've ever been to a, African American church, I, I love it. I totally love it, man. It's, it's real, my speed, man. They're like, ah, just, everybody's having a good time. So everybody's just like blowing out major testimonies. And I sat there and he, he goes, young man, would you say something? And I was kind of like where John is there, a little further back. And he said, I said, I got up and I go, you know, I'm just so, nice, so happy to be with you people. I'm talking just like I am, no, nothing. Brr. Like, I'm just happy to be here. It just really blessed me. And what you said there spoke to me. And this guy stopped and he said, Michael, come up here. Now remember, this is the day I felt, I asked God, I asked God, I don't want to just do it, show me. And then he showed me in the word. Then that very day, all of a sudden he said, he said, Michael, come here. He said, I can't give you the gift, God's given it to you. He said, uh, he starts describing the story of David about how that God said, don't look at the outside, look at the heart. And when I came to the front, he said, I can't give you the gift. God's given it to you. And he put oil, I pray, put, put oil on me. And I can't wait to go to heaven and see this guy. I don't, even, I don't even know his name. I've never been to the church ever again. And then from that point on, God just began to confirm it to me and showed it to me. I'd be in service. It was just amazing. But God had to take me out of my comfort zone. And as I was talking to Jeremy, going back to the study this morning, we're talking about it. I said, you know, God was getting me out of my comfort zone. And even still to this day, there's times I'm like, I'm not comfortable doing that. How many got some areas in your life you're like, yeah, I'm not comfortable. Yeah. But when you and I are willing in the day of God's power, we just say, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Even if it's not comfortable to me, I'll do it. And listen, this is the cool thing. I'm not just saying this because we need help at the church. That's not it. I'm saying this for you. This is your stepping stone. This is your... When you're willing, if I didn't say, if I didn't say to my father, yeah, sure, I'll help out. Being willing when God spoke to my heart to do it, I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today because life is a succession of being willing and being open. And you might be a baby Christian. You're like, I don't know, but I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, this is your day. And as you start to just say, Lord, here I am, I believe God's gonna highlight something inside of you. And as you start to serve, it's like what Jesus said to those leopards that came to him, there was 10. And they said, Lord, heal us. And he said, well, go show yourself to the priests. And the word says, as they went, they were healed. There's something about going, there's something about doing. I believe today, as you, as, as you went, some of you got issues in, going on in your life, things that you need, more direction. But as you go, as you went, as you take that first step, you're gonna start seeing God show up. You're gonna start seeing things happening in your life like never before. Your journey starts with the glistening of your heart because the spirit of man gives inspiration. And I want everyone in this room, let's just bow our heads. Let's just wait look to the Lord. Father, I thank you for the word that you gave me to minister to these precious people. Lord, I can only say, and I, but I trust confidently that you are the God that speaks deep into the heart. You just, you just, you just, you speak deeply inside of them. And you reveal yourself to them. That, that the words I spoke have a life and a wing and a breath and a, they're soaring and they're flying because only you Holy Spirit can do that the igniting in the spirit of those precious hearts of these people and say this with me say here I am Lord speak to me show me Lord show me the next step and Lord I choose right now to be willing and obedient to what you speak to me today. And I thank you, Lord, that my steps are ordered by you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it.
should have asked him to just say grace. <laughs> so we're just going to pray over the food right now. And um, then I just encourage all the workers to get out to your tables. And folks, just take a moment. Even if you have no idea what it is that you should do, just take a moment. It, it, it's so simple. Stop at the table. It won't take long. And uh, see what the Lord gives you, okay? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for the word that we heard this morning, Lord. We thank you that you're doing a work deep in our hearts. And Father, we just pray blessing over the food this morning. May it, you take six is far from us and Lord we bless all the hands that prepared it in Jesus name amen all right go and enjoy